carries no weapons. Yet it's the most powerful aircraft in the world. Its tail number is more prestigious than any street address. And no executive office can match its luxury appointments. For more than 50 years, American presidents have made their grand entrance aboard their personal planes. It's been the backdrop for some of history's most dramatic moments. What began as a propeller-driven army transport has changed with every advance in aviation technology and has evolved into America's turbocharged chariot of the gods. It's way beyond first class. It's Air Force One. When people come to Washington, D.C., they go to see the White House because it's a symbol of the presidency. And it's a symbol of his authority. I think the airplane's the same thing. When it shows up, he knows that people know it's the President of the United States. I've always felt the two most obvious symbols of American power were the Oval Office and Air Force One. And Air Force One is a scepter you can take with you. Uh, in some ways, it's the symbol of American royalty, but it's always the symbol of American power. There's nothing comparable to Air Force One. You have the capability of acting in any emergency, under any conditions, because the uh, technical equipment is there just like it is in the White House itself. Air Force One represents the United States of America. You see that big silver airplane with a red, white, and blue flag on a taxi up? I mean, people really get kind of emotional about it. It's exhilarating. It truly is. It happened even to me when I was at the White House being on the ground waiting for the president to come back from someplace. There's a thrill to it. And this genuine, old-fashioned, uh, not to be ashamed of thrill. For the first 117 years of the presidency, the chief executive was, for the most part, a homebody because traveling was difficult and time-consuming. He rarely left the capital city. With very few exceptions, the president stayed close to the seat of power. The first president to leave the United States while still in office was Teddy Roosevelt. In 1906, the 26th president sailed to Central America to inspect work on the Panama Canal. The progressive Roosevelt made presidential history again just 19 months out of office. On October 11, 1910, at an air show in Kinloch, Missouri, the former president joined a stunt pilot named Arch Hoxie for a quick spin in his Wright Type B biplane. Their flight didn't make the record books. They sputtered around the fairgrounds for only a few minutes. But Teddy Roosevelt chalked up another presidential first. Thirty-three years later, Franklin Roosevelt became the first president to fly while still in office. At the time, the world was at war with Nazi Germany. FDR needed to join other Allied leaders at a secret war planning conference in January 1943 in the West African city of Casablanca. With Nazi U-boats prowling the Atlantic, the Secret Service felt it would be safer for the president to travel by air. But instead of flying a military plane, they chartered a Boeing 314 flying boat and her civilian crew from Pan American World Airways. At that time, our military pilots didn't have that much flying experience as far as total flying hours are concerned, yet uh, some of the senior airline pilots had thousands of hours 
and great experience in hauling passengers. On January 11, 1943, the President boarded the Pan Am flying boat and took off for Casablanca. After two overnight refueling stops, the seaplane landed off the coast of North Africa. Roosevelt transferred to a waiting Army C-54 transport plane with TWA pilots at the controls and completed his trip to Casablanca. After the 10-day conference, FDR reboarded the waiting seaplane and flew back to the United States. On their flight home, the chief steward surprised the president with a frosted cake to celebrate his 61st birthday. The president's first airplane trip was a success. The airplane had liberated the president and changed the presidency forever. The trip also gave birth to the idea that one airplane, a military plane, should be outfitted and set aside solely for use by the president. The Army Air Force picked a C-87 Liberator Express a transport version of the B-24 bomber. It would be the first plane officially designated a presidential aircraft. The C-87, like its cousin the B-24, had a very long range. It also had another critical advantage. When Franklin Roosevelt was in his 30s, he suffered an attack of polio and for the rest of his life, he needed a wheelchair. The low door of the C-87 made it easier for the Secret Service agents to lift the president into the plane. These rare color photos reveal the plane's one-of-a-kind interior. Four custom-built compartments could be converted into sleeping spaces. It also had a walk-in closet, two lavatories, and a kitchen galley with an electric stove. In June 1943, the President's C-87 joined the Air Transport Command's VIP squadron based at Washington's National Airport. ATC assigned Major Hank Myers as the pilot, and he selected his co-pilot, Lieutenant Elmer Smith. They nicknamed their new plane the guess where to. But they never got a chance to fly FDR in his special transport. The Secret Service learned that a C-87 had crashed because of mysterious structural vibrations. And they suggested the president avoid traveling in the guess where to. We were quite disappointed because we had trained for this flight, we had planned on it and everything, and then all of a sudden we were set aside. And it was a great disappointment, I'll be honest with you. Myers and Smith got a new assignment for the guess where to, flying the First Lady on a goodwill tour of Allied bases in South America. So we spent three weeks or a little more flying around the Caribbean and South America with Mrs. Roosevelt in the airplane that he wouldn't fly in or wasn't permitted to fly in. So some people say, well, maybe there's a message there. Myers and Smith flew nearly 13,000 miles with Mrs. Roosevelt. They also flew senators and VIPs all over the world and never experienced any mysterious malfunctions. But the Secret Service still wasn't convinced. So in the summer of 1944, the Air Force looked for a better plane to serve the president. And the guess where to made its final flight to an Arkansas scrapyard. We now return to Air Force One. The Air Transport Command figured that a customized version of the reliable C-54 Skymaster would make a suitable replacement for the guess where to and finally satisfy the Secret Service. The Douglas Aircraft Company, based in Santa Monica, California, 
outfitted one of their C-54s with all the trappings of executive privilege. A big desk with an oversized leather chair. A couch that converted into a bed with the push of a button. And even a radio telephone. In the past, when FDR flew in a C-54, extra-large boarding ramps had to be built to handle his wheelchair. The sudden appearance of oversized ramps was a dead giveaway that FDR was about to arrive. The Secret Service asked that the new C-54 carry a retractable elevator. This was battery operated. It was wide enough to take his wheelchair, roll him in, and then raise him up to floor level in the cabin. And um, he was in the airplane with no, no fuss, no bother at all. In June 1944, after they returned from their South American trip with Mrs. Roosevelt, Major Myers and Lieutenant Smith were reassigned to the new aircraft. For security reasons, the plane displayed no fancy names or presidential seals. It was known only by its tail number, 7451. It was kept in a hangar at Washington's National Airport under constant guard. The extra security and special attention earned it the nickname Sacred Cow. In February 1945, Roosevelt planned to join Churchill and Stalin at a secret conference in the Russian city of Yalta. FDR sailed to an airfield in the Mediterranean. The sacred cow was waiting for him and flew him the rest of the way to Yalta. They brought him out in a wheelchair and uh, put him in the elevator and hoisted him up into the airplane and then dropped him down again when we got into Russia. As far as moving around in the airplane or anything like that, he did not move around because he was quite ill. The short hops in and out of Yalta would be FDR's only trips aboard the sacred cow. Two months later, on April 12, 1945, he passed away. Although a reluctant flyer, Franklin Roosevelt had opened the era of presidential flight. Harry Truman inherited the sacred cow from his former boss. Unlike FDR, Truman loved to fly. He kept Hank Myers, Elmer Smith, and the sacred cow very busy. He enjoyed coming up in the cockpit and either taking my seat or the other pilot's seat and sitting there for an hour or so and just looking out the window and chatting with us about any little thing and not having people bother him or anything to think about, just being friendly. radar. The Air Force bought the state-of-the-art airliner to replace the aging sacred cow. Rather than allowing the press to name the airplane, the office of the presidential pilot felt we'd better have a jump start and put our own name on the airplane. They selected the name Independence. This was not only the hometown of Truman, but it also had a national flavor to it. The stylized Eagle paint scheme, considered too extravagant for the government's lean budget, was a gift of the Douglas Aircraft Company. The Independence, officially a C-118, made presidential flight more convenient. It offered a larger stateroom for the president that converted into a more comfortable bedroom. The cabin had room for an additional 25 passengers. And a fully stocked kitchen galley could prepare meals for all on board. Even with the most modern airliner and years of experience, the crew still faced the pressure of flying the world's most influential leader. 
senators and secretaries would come down and get the crew aside now. You boys be careful because you got the president on board and he's the only one we have. Well, we look at it differently. He's lucky to be flying with us because we like life and we're going to come home, boy. I believe it. I'm not going to do anything stupid up there. Myers and Smith flew Truman so often that their special tricks of the trade became standard procedure. In effect, they wrote the book on VIP travel. We always padded our flight plan with 10 or 15 minutes extra just in case we ran into winds or some unforecast thing so we could either we could throttle back and, and kill the time off so we'd always land right on the dot. In October 1950, Truman flew to the tiny South Pacific island of Wake. He went there to discuss the progress of the Korean War with General Douglas MacArthur. It was a brief, though remarkable, visit. It set the stage for the eventual clash between Truman and the General. And at 7,000 miles, it was the longest air journey of the Truman presidency. During Harry Truman's busy seven years in office, the chief executive's aircraft became a working extension of the Oval Office. On January 20th, 1953, Dwight D. Eisenhower was sworn in as the 34th U.S. President. Eisenhower exercised his presidential prerogative and selected a new plane and a new crew. Hank Myers had already left the Air Force and returned to American Airlines. And Elmer Smith, who served as the president's co-pilot for 10 years, took a desk job in the Air Force and turned in his presidential wings. The new president favored the sleek Lockheed Constellation. In military jargon, a C-121. Ike selected a Constellation already in the VIP fleet in Washington. Tail number 8610. He named it the Columbine, after the state flower of his wife's native Colorado. Standard procedure in the Air Force was to designate a flight by its tail number. In 1953, this led to a frightening case of mistaken identity during radio communication between the President's plane, an Eastern Airlines flight, and the Washington Air Traffic Control Center in Richmond. Eisenhower's co-pilot, Colonel Bill Thomas, was on the radio for that fateful call. I called in saying, uh, Air Force 8610, uh, Richmond, 12,000 feet. And the uh, center came back and said, Roger, 610, uh, report uh, at 15. And about two or three seconds later, uh, another voice came on and said, uh, Center, did you call Eastern 610? And uh, Center came back and said, no, I was working an Air Force airplane. The mix-up between Eastern Airlines 610 and Air Force 610 was too close for comfort. So they came up with the idea that uh, any airplane that the President was in would henceforth be designated as Air Force One. Regardless of its tail number or nickname, from the moment the president came aboard to the minute he departed, that plane would carry the radio call sign Air Force One. On November 24th, 1954, the Air Force proudly welcomed the newest member of the presidential fleet, a Lockheed Super Constellation, tail number 7885. First Lady Mamie Eisenhower christened the new aircraft Columbine 3, not with champagne, but with a bottle of Colorado Rocky Mountain Spring Water. The sleek, graceful Super Constellation designated VC-121 was bigger, faster, and offered greater range than its predecessor. Columbine 3 represented the state-of-the-art in VIP travel. Full galley facilities, sophisticated instrument landing systems, radar altimeter, air-to-ground telephone, and secure teletype.
President Eisenhower was himself a private pilot, and he loved to fly. While in office, Ike logged more than 30,000 miles a year as a passenger. One of the reasons that Eisenhower liked it was that it presented him with an absolutely uninterruptible meeting place. Uh, if he had certain things that he had to do, he'd get the people necessary to, that would work on that project and get them on the airplane. And he knew that there wasn't going to be any interruption. Eisenhower appreciated the value of Air Force One as a powerful tool of Cold War politics. He came into the office having uh, been a world traveler. He knew the uh, value of face-to-face -face confrontation when problems came up. I think that he changed the complexion of uh, world politics because of that. Columbine 3 was a beautiful aircraft, but it was still propeller-driven. By the late 50s, the Soviets were arriving at conferences in jets. America was unwilling to accept this loss of prestige. In 1958, the Boeing 707 was chosen as the next presidential plane. Three 707s were modified for the Special Air Missions, or SAM Squadron. Tail numbers 970, 971, and 972. On May 12, 1959, the Air Force took delivery of the first new jet at Boeing's Seattle plant. On its flight back to Washington, it set a coast-to-coast -coast speed record, just three hours and 44 minutes. In December, President Eisenhower embarked on an unprecedented international tour, 11 countries in just 18 days. During Ike's final year in office, the dazzling speed of the jets inspired him to increase his air mileage from 30,000 to nearly 80,000 miles. In the spring of 1960, Ike scheduled a trip to Russia. Secretly, aircraft 970 was specially modified for the mission. John Foster Dulles, who was Secretary of State, and his brother Alan Dulles, who was a uh, director of the CIA for uh, Eisenhower, had this great idea they would equip Air Force One with the same cameras that were being used on the U-2 spy planes, which were tremendous cameras. They could, at uh, uh, 50,000 feet, they could read a, uh, you know, a license plate on an automobile. And they wanted to do it particularly because they wanted to be able to take pictures of all the Soviet military uh, installations on the ground. However, the mission was never carried out. On May 1st, 1960, the Russians shot down an American U-2 spy plane. The embarrassing incident canceled Ike's trip, and the spy cameras were removed. By the time John Kennedy took office, most presidential trips were aboard the three jets. With aircraft 970 designated as the primary plane. the Air Force had ordered a new long-range 707. The Kennedys wanted a fresh look for the new aircraft. Instead of the military's high-visibility day-glow orange, they favored something more stylish and more national in character. Noted industrial designer Raymond Loy was commissioned to redesign the exterior. The results were the elegant paint scheme that remains to this day. The new 707 was magnificent. The first jet designed and built specifically for presidential travel. She could cruise at over 620 miles per hour and fly non-stop for more than 7,000 miles, some 2,500 miles more than the old 707s. She had an impressive array of luxury amenities, a spacious stateroom with sleeping accommodations for the president and first lady, first-class seating for up to 50 additional passengers, sophisticated communications that allowed the president secure telephone calls anywhere in the world, and the plane even offered the ability to cook fresh meals from scratch right on board. But when tail number 26,000 was first delivered, it was lacking one notable feature, the presidential seal. 
Colonel James Swindoll, Kennedy's Air Force One pilot, recommended a modification. We went back through the Air Force and uh, the White House to suggest a seal be put on it because we wanted to uh, reserve that airplane for the president as much as possible. And with that seal on it, uh, either the president had to prove who used it or he had to use it. The new plane emerged as the gleaming symbol of America, matching the dynamic image of the nation's young president. JFK loved Air Force One. His travels were memorable, but he was only able to enjoy his flying White House for a brief time. The plane was just over a year old when it carried him to Dallas, Texas. On the morning of November 22nd, 1963, President Kennedy arrived at Love Field. The horrible events of the next few hours would focus the eyes of the world on Dallas and Air Force One. At one o'clock in the afternoon, America's 35th president was pronounced dead. Fearing a wider conspiracy, the Secret Service rushed Vice President Lyndon Johnson to the security of Air Force One. I, I met him at the foot of the stairs and I addressed him as Mr. President because I knew, I knew at that time that President Kennedy had already passed away. And uh, when he came on board, he, he asked us to close the uh, window shades just in case somebody wanted to take a shot at him. Immediately, preparations were made to fly the slain president back to Washington. It didn't seem proper for the casket to ride in the baggage area, so seats and partitions were removed to make room in the passenger compartment. At 2.37 p.m., Lyndon Johnson was sworn in. Jackie Kennedy stood bravely at his side, her clothes still splattered with her husband's blood. Just 10 minutes later, Air Force One was airborne, heading home to Washington. An aircraft filled with stunned silence and paralyzing grief. In addition to Air Force One's own security, each state's Air National Guard is assigned as extra security for Air Force One. Aircraft 26000 was never given any nickname. The plane itself became known as Air Force One. But still, any Air Force plane the President boards takes on the Air Force One call sign. If the President flies in a Marine aircraft, it becomes Marine One. Army, Army One. If the Vice President is flying, the call sign becomes Air Force Two. But if the passenger is the First Lady or any other VIP, the flight is designated just by the tail number. In 1972, another Boeing 707 was added to the Presidential Fleet. A virtual twin of 26,000, tail number 27,000. These two aircraft were continually upgraded and together served as Air Force One until 1990. With each change in administration, the plane took on a new personality, symbolic of the policies and the style of each president. The most spectacular there was Lyndon Johnson's uh, throne room, as we called it. Uh, he had a special chair built uh, that would raise up and down at a push of a button so that he could be always at least at eye level or higher that eye level than anybody else seated in the compartment with him. He also installed a table that could electronically raise and lower to be used as a conference table, a coffee table, or just to make visitors feel small. President Johnson was a very gregarious human being. And when he talked, he wanted everybody to pay attention to him. So they then put in plexiglass bulkheads in the airplane. Now he could stand in the front of the airplane and look down through the whole tube and talk to everybody at the same time, which he liked to do. And as a matter of fact, he liked it so much that they used to have little microphones 
stashed away at places in the airplane so that if he says, hey, get me a microphone, the steward, all he had to do was reach up here in this compartment, pull it out and hand it to him. And he was on the public address system. He just wanted people to pay attention to him. Richard Nixon restored the aircraft to a more traditional layout and a more reserved demeanor. He usually stayed in his stateroom alone or with a few advisors. But his pilot, Colonel Ralph Albertazzi, remembers the flight crew often had to tend to Nixon's mechanical needs. It was a kind of a joke among the stewards. How quickly were they going to get called to straighten up something that he had screwed up? You know, he couldn't get the seat right, or he couldn't turn turn on the radio, or he couldn't watch the television, or he didn't know how to work the telephone, or those kind of things. He was, we called him mechanically disinclined. Nixon's tenure aboard Air Force One will be best remembered for his historic trips to the Soviet Union and China. And of course, the dramatic transition of power after his resignation in 1974. During Nixon's final trip aboard the plane, Vice President Ford would be sworn in in Washington. We now have a president who's going to leave Washington, D.C. and then route to California, become the ex-president. So we had coordinated with the Federal Aviation Administration and the other ground support agencies. And at the moment that the Vice President, Jerry Ford, would say, I do, to the oath of office, we would change our call sign from Air Force One to SAM 27,000. And uh, that's the way it happened. And it happened over Missouri at 39,000 feet. Lee Simmons was an Air Force One steward and he recalls visiting Nixon in his stateroom right after the change in power. I went into his uh, compartment to say I'm very sorry that you're going to be leaving the presidency and let him know how much I appreciate uh, how much he has done for me. But before I could really console him, he was consoling me by telling me, you know, everything's going to be okay. You take care of your family and you hang in there and, and let life continue as it is and, and don't let it get you down. Well, I walked out of there with uh, my head down and with tears in my eyes because I was not prepared for that. I wanted to go in and say something comforting to him. and It turned out that he was trying to comfort me. At the end of Nixon's last flight, he requested a group photo with his dedicated Air Force One crew. Gerald Ford's sudden ascendance to the presidency left him little time to modify Air Force One. My wife Betty and I made no changes. Of course, we came in rather unexpectedly and with not any real uh, forewarning. And when we took over, uh, we had a lot more important things to do than to fool around with any changes in Air Force One. Whenever I flew on Air Force One, I had my staff there, I had the communications capability. Secretary of State uh, Kissinger would be along and we would discuss uh, what was on the agenda in this country where we were going for meetings. So Air Force One was a working office. For President Ford, Air Force One offered sanctuary after the assassination attempt by Sarah Jane Moore in San Francisco in 1975. Well, after Sarah Jane Moore took the shot, the Secret Service jammed me into the limousine and we drove literally, I'm told, 90 miles an hour from the center of San Francisco out to the airport. So we got to the airport ahead of Mrs. Ford Normally, she would be on board, and I would get on, and we would take off. But we got there early. So she lands, and she notices all the excitement around Air Force One, but doesn't know what happened. She walks into the lounge in the aircraft, uh, Air Force One, and uh, blithefully says, well, how did they treat you in San Francisco? President Jimmy Carter wanted the airplane to reflect the character of his entire administration. Leaner budgets, 
austerity programs, and no free souvenirs on Air Force One. They were trying to get the message through that they weren't going to be uh, an extravagant, overspending White House. Uh, a lot of things uh, were cut throughout the administration, but as far as the airplane went, uh, we did away with all the freebies, uh, would not accept anything from the soft drink companies, cigarette companies, uh, etc. And uh, it's kind of uh, bare bones. Ronald and Nancy Reagan brought back some of the amenities to the airplane. But still, Air Force One remained a working office. You got on the plane and usually immediately went to work. There were always speeches to write, uh, things to research, phone, phone calls to be made back to Washington. There was none of this uh, trade tables in your upright position stuff. I mean, sometimes we'd be landing and we'd be, you'd be standing at a Xerox machine peeling off the last pages of the president's speech. Marlon Fitzwater flew extensively with both Presidents Reagan and Bush and was able to gain a special insight into the two men. There was an informality about long flights on the plane. President Bush and President Reagan both would usually change into comfortable clothes, maybe jogging suits or uh, casual clothes of some kind. And it was kind of a rare opportunity to see the president uh, at ease, if you will, and to hear what he thought, to hear how he thought and how he reasoned. And a lot of staff people never get that opportunity when you're in the White House. During the, uh, the Cold War, we, would, uh, we had several summit meetings in uh, the Soviet Union or visits to China and other places where uh, we knew that our rooms were bugged. Uh, we knew people were listening to us all the time. And so getting back on the plane was such a safe haven and you felt like, I'm back in the loving arms of America again, just get me home. In the late 1980s, the most impressive aircraft to bear the call sign Air Force One came together inside this cavernous Boeing factory in Everett, Washington. Piece by piece, this 747-200B grew into a flying machine of unparalleled capability. At first glance, it's a typical jumbo jet, six stories tall and 231 feet long. But that's where the similarities end. The 747, tail number 28000, came off the assembly line protected by an anti-corrosive coating and flew to the Boeing Modification Center in Wichita, Kansas. Technicians in Wichita fitted the plane with equipment you won't find on standard 747s, like two retractable stairways and a self-contained baggage loading ramp. Cabinet makers handcrafted each piece of interior furniture. Boeing also added some equipment normally reserved for combat planes, like ECM, or electronic countermeasures, that jam enemy radar and alert the crew to surface-to-air missiles, and dispensers that eject flares to confuse and divert heat-seeking weapons. On the flight back to the Boeing factory, the crew practiced one of the plane's unique capabilities, in-flight refueling. The ability to take fuel from an Air Force tanker jet means that this plane, at least theoretically, can remain airborne indefinitely. After getting its famous blue and white paint job, the plane flew from Boeing to its new home at Andrews Air Force Base in Washington, D.C. On September 6, 1990, President George Bush came aboard for his first trip in the new plane, and tail number 28000 officially became Air Force One. Isn't this beautiful? 
You see the hot tub? <laughs> It was really uh, magical because no one had ever seen a plane that big or that luxurious or outfitted the way Air Force One was. You couldn't be prepared for this conference room that was as big as the conference room in the White House uh, for the luxury of the, of the seating and for an aisle that went the full length of the plane and you, you felt like you were flying in the Waldorf Astoria when you were, when you were flying on the plane. And that first flight, I remember just sitting here thinking, uh, this can't this can't be real. I mean, the plane is so big and constructed in such a way that you can walk around. Uh, there's a lot of interaction between people, and so you just lose that whole kind of sense of being uh, cooped up someplace. It virtually eliminates uh, jet lag. Four thousand square feet of floor space make this the largest airborne White House to serve a president. It can accommodate seventy passengers and 26 crew members. Two kitchens can dish out up to 100 meals at a time. Freezers can store enough food to feed everybody for a week. It has 85 telephones, 19 TV monitors, 11 VCRs, and top secret satellite communications equipment. The first time you go on Air Force One, you want to call your mom. And the grandness of it is that the Air Force One operator comes on the phone and says, you know, Mrs. Fitzwater, I have your son calling from 33,000 feet over western Kansas. Will you take the call? And she says, of course not, you fool, and hangs up. And then you call back again. There are actually two presidential 747s. With the exception of the tail number, they're identical twins. Often, the second aircraft will follow the first as an emergency backup. They're known officially as VC-25s. And the price tag for both planes, $300 million. They're looked after by 140 hand-picked specialists of the Presidential Pilots Office, part of the 89th Airlift Wing. Security receives the highest priority. Even the maintenance people work in pairs to make sure no person operating alone has access to the plane. Because of the unpredictability of presidential schedules, the crews keep the planes ready to fly within a moment's notice. Being part of the elite presidential support team means these people are the best at what they do. The people that you see maintaining the aircraft, the people that you see flying our aircraft are probably the best troops that we have in the Air Force. We go through a very highly selective process to hire them into the 89th, and then we give them the extra training that brings them up to the standards that we need day to day, and they are ready to go whenever the president needs them. Air Force One doesn't carry an emergency presidential parachute or hidden escape pod for the chief executive. Special security forces guard the plane constantly and even travel with the president aboard his aircraft. When the president travels overseas, many countries offer Air Force One the honor of a fighter escort. But an escort raises the risk of a mid-air collision with a foreign fighter plane, and the offers are respectfully turned down. What was once a rare and very risky part of the president's job has become a necessary, safe, and very much envied aspect of the presidency. For nearly 50 years, Air Force One has remained the clearest demonstration that the most powerful man in the world has arrived. The History Channel proudly offers the program you're watching on home video for only $24.95 plus shipping and handling. To order, call 1-800-708-1776 or shop online at HistoryChannel.com. Military targets are the objective. Innocent civilians pay the price. I believe there were several thousand people killed. Tactical error? Bomber Command was just not hitting its targets. Or collateral damage. At the time, they were the enemy. 
on History Undercover, next, only on the History Channel.